electrical power generation. A special report by Mr. Matter and Ms. Shaw of Bartlesville High School in Northeast Oklahoma. Darkness. It reminds us of our dependence on electricity. Join Ms. Shaw and me on a trip to a typical electric power plant where we hope to shed some light on the subject of electric power generation. We hopped in a car and drove 40 miles from Bartlesville to Oolaga, Oklahoma. Oolaga is the birthplace of Will Rogers and is also the home of the public service company of Oklahoma's Northeast Power Plant. As you approach the plant, you can see two natural gas-fired generators to the left of the smokestack. To the right are two coal-fired generators. At the plant entrance, Mr. Metter calls the plant superintendent, asking permission to enter. Plant Superintendent Gary Briggs outfitted us with hard hats so that we could tour the 1.5 billion watt facility. The first stop is the coal car dumper where 110 train cars a day bring in low sulfur coal from Wyoming. The cars are turned upside down and the coal is carried by a conveyor belt to a large storage yard. Samples of the incoming coal are sent to this on-site lab and analyzed for impurities and energy content. Wyoming coal has less energy content than the native Oklahoma coal. However, Oklahoma coal has more sulfur, which contributes to acid rain. Back in the coal storage yard, a 60-day reserve supply is maintained. In 1994, this entire reserve was used up because of train delays due to floods. PSO responded by buying electrical power from other utilities. Power plants across the United States are interconnected so that they can buy and sell power between each other. The coal in the storage yard is compacted to reduce dust and keep air away from the coal. Otherwise, spontaneous combustion could occur. Coal is fed into the plant by shoveling it over to this giant machine, which scoops it up onto a conveyor belt. The conveyor belt carries the coal up to the top of the plant. There, the coal is crushed to the consistency of talcum powder and blown by air into a 50-foot-tall boiler. The purpose of any power plant boiler is to heat water into steam. Here we see Briggs by one of the plant's coal boilers. It burns coal to heat water to 1,000 degree Fahrenheit steam. Not all of the coal entering the boiler can be burned. The unburned heavy ash falls to the bottom of the boiler and is removed and used for road base and cinder blocks. The lighter fly ash goes up the smokestack where it is given a negative charge and drawn off by an electrostatic precipitator. This material is used in concrete and cement. The steam from the boiler is sent to the power plant's turbine. One of the plant's turbine generator systems was being dismantled for maintenance, so we were able to inspect some of its parts. Steam from the boiler pushes against the fan blades of the turbine. This turns a shaft leading into the generator. Magnets on the end of the shaft spin inside a coil of wire to create the electricity.
Here are the fan blades in the turbine which are rotated by the steam. Magnets attached to one end of the spinning turbine shaft rotate inside this giant coil of wire. The spinning magnetic field pushes the electrons in the wire creating the electrical current. The generators must be cooled or they will crack. Cooling water from Lake Uliga is pumped through these tubes in the 10 inch thick generator walls. 200,000 gallons of water flow through these tubes each minute. To prevent environmental damage, this water must be cooled before it is returned to the lake. It is pumped to cooling towers where some of the water evaporates, which cools the remaining water. The clouds of steam we see rising above the power plant are this evaporated water. Here we see the control room from which the entire plant is monitored. To protect the power plant's equipment, startups and shutdowns must be done carefully and slowly. This power plant actually cannot start up on its own, but must borrow power from another plant to preheat its generator. If the power plant needs to shut down, the large batteries shown here provide the power for a controlled stop. The plant's generator produces electricity at 22,000 volts. One large transformer outside the plant steps the voltage down to 5,000 volts. This power is used to run the plant's fans as well as the electromagnets inside the generator. A second transformer outside the plant connects the generator to the cross-country power lines. It steps the voltage up from 22,000 volts to 345,000 volts. This high voltage lowers the current in the cross-country lines, which reduces energy loss. The high voltage electricity is sent to the switchyard, where it is routed to various cities. Having completed our tour, we leave the plant and trace an outbound line which leads to a city substation. To minimize weight, electrical power lines are not covered with insulation. They are bare wire. A cross-country power line feeds into this substation near Tri-County Tech in Bartlesville. The substation has giant circuit breakers and also step-down transformers which lower the voltage to 13,800 volts for citywide distribution. Here is a city power line. The top wire carries no current because it tends to be struck by lightning. The three wires below it carry higher voltage electricity across town. Three smaller wires below those carry lower voltage electricity to nearby neighborhoods. The lowest wires on the line are for phone and cable television service. Here we see a pole mounted neighborhood transformer. It lowers the 13,800 volts from the city power line to 120 volts for use in homes and businesses. Here Ms. Shaw inspects another type of transformer used in neighborhoods with below ground wiring. And at last, we reach a home or business, where the amount of electrical energy being used is measured by a meter. And that concludes our special report on electrical power generation. Now you know what's on the other end of a power line.